Hey y'all, Scott here, and I can't wait to finally head to this game controller issues meeting I just found out about. Yep, yeah, I sure that pretty bad. Whoa, my hands are doing this. And it wouldn't be possible without the overlooked messiah of all video games, the controller. The pathway between you and the world within the screen. A game controller needs to house all the necessary input methods for games in its era, while also being incredibly transparent. It's best when it just melts into your hands and you don't have to think about where the B button is, it's just all second nature. However, the road to where we are now has been a rocky one. We've gone from to, to even. And that road started way early on. Video games need to be controllable to be considered games. So even back in the early days of scientists pissing around and making games on supercomputers instead of curing diseases, they had to create ways to play the games, like with the tried and true knob and button combo used for Tennis for Two in 1958. When arcade machines hit the scene, developers had to design the controls for each of their games, and thus their imagination wasn't compromised by limiting control methods. They could create whatever control method would suit their game best. Joysticks, trackballs, knobs, buttons, steering wheels, each arcade machine was different from the last in terms of controls, so when home video game consoles were in development, there was definitely a hurdle to overcome. Developers were used to having free range with how to control their games in the arcade. How do you create a controller that can be a jack of all trades, one that can work with all or at the very least a lot of the games released at the time? Atari said f it and gave us a bun and a stick. The Atari 2600 was the first major success in terms of home video game consoles with interchangeable cartridges. The first video game console ever, 1972's Magnavox Odyssey, sure did have a controller all right. The Fairchild Channel F predated the 2600 by a year, releasing in 1976 and has you holding a Snickers bar to control games. But the Atari 2600's joystick is definitely what the general public sees as the first video game controller, and definitely one of the most iconic. While its simplicity made many games harder to convert to the system, it's undeniable it played a key role in its success. No matter who you are, you look at this thing and say, yeah, that makes sense. How could you possibly screw this up? It's a giant red button and a rod. Anybody who's anybody knows what that's about. When you look back at video game successes in the early days, it's apparent that success came with controls that were easy enough for the general consumer to understand. And the 2600 controller was just that. Nevertheless, this thing is just a no-go nowadays. This stick needs to go see a doctor. It's just too stiff. And the overall size of the controller is a problem, for me at least. It's too small to comfortably hold the joystick with one hand and the rest of the controller with the other, and it's too big to comfortably hold it like a modern controller. Overall though, I'd say the 2600 controller was all right for what it was. It's completely usable by anybody, just nothing you jump at the chance to use. After the 2600, controllers went through this ugly phase for a while, and it was all because a controller designer went home for the weekend, looked at his phone and said, I'm drunk. Why? Yeah, the Intellivision, ColecoVision, even Atari themselves with the Atari 5200 all followed the hot trend of putting a number pad on the controller. Let me ask you this, in what dimension do games this simple need more than nine buttons? Many games came with overlays to put on the controller so you know what each button does, but that just kind of forces you to constantly look at the controller to know what to press with or without the overlays. In my opinion, that's when a controller fails, when you have to look away from the game to figure out what the hell you're supposed to press. Well, after all that flopped, we then make our way to the Nintendo Entertainment System, a true innovation for controllers, breaking away from the joystick to form something that was more compact and easier to hold. The Vectrex in 1982 had a similar form factor for its controller, but the NES introduced something huge. Now I know, first thing many people probably said when they saw this cross on the controller was pump the brake speed racer, nobody puts religion in my dig dug. But this cross design called the D-pad made the controller way more comfortable to use with just your thumb. Nintendo used the D-pad beforehand on one of their Game & Watch handhelds, and precursors to it appeared elsewhere, but the NES shot the D-pad into the mainstream, and with that, the joystick was old news. Many consider this guy to have aged poorly, and while I do somewhat agree, I think it's still all right to use. My main problem is the D-pad itself is a bit uncomfortable after long play sessions. But I love the feel of the buttons, just so clicky and satisfying to just go to town on. This is where the term button mashing was born. I see a lot of people say the sharp corners really dig into their hands, but I've never personally had an issue with them. However, the sharpness was criticized even back in the day, so Nintendo responded with some alternatives. The NES Advantage is the controller you never let your daughter go to prom with. This thing is a hulking beast that's powered by two whole controller ports. 
You can flip a switch to alternate between player one and two for games like Super Mario Brothers, where you alternate turns. There's turbo buttons with knobs, which allow you to have rapid fire on A and B, and don't forget the state-of-the-art slow motion feature, which was just simply the game constantly pausing and unpausing itself. That meant for games that featured anything on the screen when paused, they just looked off. Regardless, the NES Advantage is a beaut of a controller. I think this thing is really slick. It just feels so sturdy and there's something so satisfying about pressing these huge buttons. But what if you're not into overcompensating? Well, the NES Max may be for you, featuring a new grippable design, the turbo buttons of the Advantage, alongside something called the Cycloid, a bit of a precursor to the 3DS Circle Pad. It's much easier to grip thanks to these new thighs, but the cycloid really isn't a replacement for the D-pad in my opinion. Now, with the introduction of the NES top loader, Nintendo redesigned the standard NES controller, nicknamed the Dog Bone. This thing was so close to being the perfect NES controller. The rounded edges, the nicer feeling D-pad, but they just had to angle the A and B buttons so only a lobster could hold it correctly. It just doesn't feel right. Nobody's hand normally rests like this on a controller. It's just uncomfortable. Well, since the original NES controller worked, many simply tried to copy it. The Sega Master System and TurboGrafx-16 controllers, while different in some ways, were basically just their version of the NES controller. Atari decided to barge into the party with their 7800 controller, and I'm pretty sure everybody stared at them until they released this instead. Only in Europe, though, in the US, US, we retreated to this, and over there they got this. Lucky them. Of course, Sega had to do something different with the Sega Master System's follow-up, so they brought out this three-buttoned hunk. Anybody else ever realize just how big the Sega Genesis controller really is? Like, whoa. This guy has some meat on its bones, but weirdly enough, it only has the same amount of buttons as the NES controller. Like, it doesn't have a select button, so even though it has three face buttons, they both have four in total. That led to problems down the line when fighting games were coming over, which required more buttons, so Sega crammed some more in with the introduction of the six-button controllers. Shove your hand between the couch cushions and you'll find various Sega Genesis controllers, each different from the last. Like, Sega released so many Genesis controller variants, it's crazy. They're all different in terms of design, button placement, D-pads, it, it's ridiculous. I interrupt your regularly scheduled me with an emergency report by me. Controllers made by other companies, not the console manufacturers themselves, are running rampant. And most are up to no good. This is the third party controller watch list. Our mission statement is to bring more awareness to sh here we have the TAC-50 joystick for your local Sega Genesis system. It falls in line with the rest of the, I guess if that's what you want sort of thing, controllers. It's not bad, but it doesn't necessarily work well with the vast majority of the Sega Genesis library. It does have these suction cups on its base, which makes it harder to move around on a coffee table, and it also looks pretty good on a windshield. The six button controllers are fine and good, but the three button one is the classic. The one my mind immediately shoots to when Genesis is on the mind, and it's a solid controller in its own right. It may be a bit bulky, but it feels good. However, it was completely outdone by the makers of Chibi Robo Ziplash. The SNES controller is magnificent. It may not be my favorite of all time, but it does so much so right. The buttons are lined up in this beautiful way where it's so comfortable to use your thumb to press the Y button with the rest of it resting on B, ready to use at a moment's notice. Excellent for games like Super Mario World or Mega Man X. Shoulder buttons came swinging in L and R with all buttons in the D-pad feeling exquisite. Couple that with the rounded shape and this is something that dreams are made of. Weirdly enough, with the release of the Super Nintendo Classic Edition in 2017, Nintendo re-released a new version of the controller with a less glossy, rougher type of plastic for the controller shell. And I gotta say, I actually prefer the new release. It just feels a bit better in my opinion. Atari, just go home. The Atari Jaguar brought back the classic number pad. I'm sure they looked at Sega combating Nintendo by adding more buttons to their controller and shrieked, yep, that's the next big craze. More than 12 buttons, the kids will love us. Next up, the original PlayStation came to be due to a failed partnership between Sony and Nintendo, which would focus on a CD add-on for the SNES. After that bust, Sony created their own console based on their knowledge from working with Nintendo, which is pretty obvious looking at the controller. I sometimes forget how similar the PlayStation and SNES controllers are. I mean, fundamentally, the only main differences are the D-pad, two sets of shoulder buttons, and thighs. 
that's it. However, the PlayStation controller finally became a man with the DualShock. Look at the size of these things. This redesign features Meteor triggers, a rumble feature, and dual analog sticks. The rumble and analog were obviously responses to the Nintendo 64's controller, which came before it, and we'll get to that in due time. But the DualShock made dual sticks a standard. It also introduced clicking down on the sticks as an additional button input, which, can I say something here? R1, L1, R2, L2. These are shoulder buttons, it makes sense they're numbered like this. Why are these called R3 and L3? Anyways, I love the feel of the analog sticks, they're so smooth and the texture works so well. But what if the DualShock just isn't doing anything for you, and you hate happiness? Here's the Nintendo 64 controller. This came out after the original PlayStation controller and before the DualShock, and man, we can bark about this controller all we want, but gotta admit, this thing was innovative in so many ways. Controlling a game in 3D with the analog control stick, camera control, four player multiplayer being standard on the console, even the trigger on the back, give your finger a cock and BAM! This was a huge leap forward for the industry, yes, but answer me this. Just what the hell is this thing? Three prongs make it so you have multiple ways to play multiple games. Maybe you can hold it like this, or this, or even this. But that means not all the buttons are readily available to the player in any of the controller holding styles. Also, the stick is garbage. This thing is just a skinny, plastic, uncomfortable piece of work that wears out too easily. Now, the Nintendo 64 controller did a lot right. It introduced Rumble with the Rumble Pack accessory. The analog stick brought us games like Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time. And look at these colors. This thing is a colorblind Scott Wozniak's worst nightmare. Yep, I don't like this controller. Moving on, the Sega Saturn controller, was pretty decent. Basically just an evolution of the Genesis six button ones with shoulder buttons this time around. But Sega also introduced the 3D control pad for a few games, specifically Nights Into Dreams. And this controller leads us into its immediate successor on Sega's last home console, the Sega Dreamcast controller. Yep, I don't like this controller. Now is this controller as bad as the Nintendo 64's? God no. It actually has a layout that makes sense. Well, this stick is just not comfortable. This was still when many companies didn't realize that hard plastic on an analog stick isn't mankind's favorite thing out there. Also, why does the wire come out of the bottom? There's a groove for you to pop the cord in near the top, so that way it's pointing in the right direction, which just kind of comes off as a slight fix to a design oversight. At least the triggers were analog, which was a solid innovation, and definitely made racing games more realistic. But who could forget the VMU, the memory card with a screen displaying info or housing its own games to be played? But f that! PlayStation's back, baby, with the PlayStation 2's all-new DualShock 2. This is the same controller, except the face buttons are now analog, which is dumb. Why do you need the triangle button to be pressure sensitive? Why? It felt like they just assumed analog inputs were the next big thing, but you don't need it for everything. Well, moving past that, we have the introduction of the Xbox brand, and with it, holy sh**. Well, I can tell you first off, that was the easiest Easter egg hunt I've ever been a part of. This controller does get a number of things right. Number one, giant f***ing Xbox logo. The Duke, as it's referred to now, is a behemoth. It's big for the sake of being big. There's no reason for it to be this way. Now it's completely usable, but it's just not that great when you get down to it. Like, what is this? Seriously. Also, the dual sticks just feel weird. Like, the left one has a large concave area, and the right one has a much smaller area, which honestly feels like it's convex. God, I need a shower. Microsoft designed a smaller controller for the Japanese market that made its way over to the States later down the line, and this is much more reasonable. I can actually get behind this one, it just feels much better, everything actually makes sense this time. After Nintendo wouldn't stop laughing for five years straight, they really cleaned up their act with the GameCube controller. This thing is pure comfort, it just feels right in the hands. The button layout is definitely different compared to every other controller, and while I prefer the more traditional design, this layout makes a lot of sense. The main face button you'd probably use in most games is A, so why not have everything orbit around it? The triggers are crazy satisfying to click down, and the left stick is leagues better than the Nintendo 64 one. I love this controller, but while it's one of my favorites, it does have some gross parts. The D-pad and C-stick were made for ants, and the lack of another shoulder button is a bit odd. Regardless, the GameCube controller has definitely stood the test of time. But these pesky wires, man, what is this, the year 2000? That's where the WaveBird comes in, a wireless variant of the controller. 
It uses radio frequency to transmit the wireless signal. The wireless controllers were around for a while, but most used IR, like a TV remote. You had to keep them pointed to the adapter for them to function properly. But all you had to do with the WaveBird was match up the dials on the controller and the adapter, and you're all set. While it wasn't the first wireless controller, I'd argue it's the first truly great one. You can go all around the room with it, and it works perfectly. The only main downside compared to going wired is that it doesn't include rumble and it takes batteries. Was the GameCube C-Stick not small enough for you? Well, do I have a bad controller for you? Introducing the GameStop branded wireless GameCube controller. Too small and uncomfortable for any of you with hands out there. The analog stick keeps with the tried and true tradition of hard plastic to make sure you hate it even more, and the buttons reek of loud plastic cheap. Also, it's been reported that if you do touch a controller like this, you will most definitely contract bed bugs, damn it. Wireless was truly the next step for controllers. We make our way to the Xbox 360, which has one of the most acclaimed controllers of all time. I mean, there was nowhere to go but up after this thing, but everything is just so finely tuned and makes for a perfectly balanced controller minus the D-pad. Microsoft later released 360 controllers with this transforming D-pad where you can have it like a traditional one or go back to this garbage. Personally, I have no clue why you'd want anything other than the more traditional D-pad, but I don't care, this thing is fun to twiddle with. Next up, the PS3 control- Jesus Christ, guys, it's been over 10 years at this point and you still haven't moved on? To be fair, Sony was set to go with an all new design for the PS3 standard controller. I've never been so happy to see this design come back. The six axis controller was there for the first few years of the PlayStation 3's life and was basically the DualShock again, but now wireless with motion control capabilities and no rumble. Sony later released a traditional DualShock 3, rumble and motion controls included. Now everything was going pretty smoothly with controllers at this point. The 360 really hit it out of the park, the PS3 was going with a time-tested design, and Nintendo. <laughs> Yeah, the PS3 controller may have had some motion controls, but the Wii Remote Fallout embraced them. There are definitely things I love and hate about this controller. When it works, it really works. When it doesn't work, it really doesn't work. We only have a D-pad on the remote with a few buttons on the front and a trigger on the back. It may seem limiting, but the controller was smartly designed to be usable in a multitude of ways. Like a TV remote, on its side like an old school NES controller, with the nunchuck attachment that actually gives you a stick, or inside a countless supply of plastic shit. I really admire how creative they got with the uses for the Wii Remote, but I'm not gonna lie and say this thing is a great controller. The sideways control method isn't my favorite, I'm just not a huge fan of this D-pad or these buttons. And like I said, the motion controls are definitely hit and miss. However, Nintendo did release the Wii Motion Plus add-on and the Wii Remote Plus to enhance the motion capabilities, and I gotta say with these, I'd say the Wii Remote is pretty alright. Motion is pretty accurate now, and when used properly, it can be a really fun controller. But if you're more into the traditional side of things, might I suggest the Wii Classic controllers? They plug into the bottom just like the nunchuck and man, I forgot how decent these things really were. The original is quite derivative of a Super Nintendo controller, but includes some modern additions like two sticks that are way too close together and buns I like to refer to as you call these triggers? There's also this mystery button on the top, which correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this was ever used and still don't know what use it was ever going to have. The original Classic controller was great for retro games, but a bit lackluster for for more modern ones, so let's flip that around, here's the Classic Controller Pro! It's much more akin to the PlayStation 2 controller, and is great for some of the more hardcore Wii games out there. Nintendo then put the Wii Remote in Photoshop, gave it a little of this, a little of that, popped a screen in the middle, and blam! Wii U gamepad. It gets a bad rap, it's huge, unnecessary, and clunky. Listen, I'm with you on a lot of that, however, I found this controller to be wildly comfortable to use. The grips are nice and all the buttons and sticks are large and feel great. The problem is this guy. The screen isn't the worst, but certainly not the best. And its use in some games was just annoying and it led to one of the worst battery lives out there. The gamepad doesn't hold a charge well at all, so if you charge it up and don't use it for a week, chances are when you pick it back up, it's gonna be dead zo. Also, you have to charge it via a separate power adapter, not the Wii U itself. And just so much garbage was thrown into this thing, I'm pretty sure you could survive in the wilderness for a week with just this. A camera, NFC, TV remote, knock it off. Almost none of that is needed. Except I will say the TV remote was pretty useful. Like with the Wii Remote, if you're not into all of this, Nintendo offered a Pro Controller and get ready Wii U Pro Controller Defense Force. I don't like this controller. It all has to do with the fact that the buttons are on the bottom. It's just so annoying and stupid. This format worked on the gamepad because it was so big. The buttons were placed in a perfectly usable location, but here, it just doesn't work for me. Also, the triggers feel weird, man. I think it's because they aren't analog, yet they're designed just like the 360s, which are. The Wii U gamepads were these fat patios for you to click and they felt good. These 
not so much. At least this controller lasts up to 80 hours on a single charge, which is something the gamepad definitely can't say. However, both got on my bad side for having this gross glossy finish. Like, this looks good in pictures and for two seconds after you open the package. Anytime afterwards, welcome to Fingerprint Avenue. Now I don't own this thing anymore due to unforeseen circumstances. If I could sue a game controller, I would first go after whatever the hell this third-party Wii U controller is and then sue the Wii Remote for deception. But I do remember everything about it and how it was the definition of everything a falsely advertised product was. This controller was trying to scam people into thinking it was a Wii U Pro controller. However, it turns out it was fundamentally just a Wii Remote and Wii Classic controller all in one. Now the idea of having a standard controller with the capabilities of a Wii Remote and Classic controller all in one is great. The problem was this controller was terrible at everything it did. The build quality was cheapo, the buttons felt like mashed potatoes. The only reason why anybody gave this controller any attention was the fact that there was a Super Nintendo and Super Famicom color scheme available. The PS4 controller actually switched some things up compared to the PlayStation controllers of the past. They went for a new, more ergonomic design, and I think it worked out pretty well. There's this touch bar now, which I personally haven't found all too useful, a light bar, which just feels like an excuse for this controller to have shitty battery life, and... Whoa, 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 where did the start and select buttons go? Yeah, the PS4 was the start of something dreadful. The death of start and select. Instead, we got this share button, which is useful enough, I guess, sharing photos and videos of gameplay. But what the hell is this options garbage? Well, whatever. I do have to say that while the DualShock 4 is comfortable and a decent controller overall, there are a few problems with the build quality. I don't know, it's just the one controller I consistently have problems with, and I'm not alone with that. The Xbox One controller feels a bit like more of the same from the 360 controller, but with random tweaks and changes that feel both better and worse. Like, it feels more premium in some cases, but cheaper in others. It's a bit more compact and trying to look more modern than the 360s. I think the D-pad is better and the sticks have a more grippy surface to them, but I don't know, there's something a bit off about this design. Not bad by any means, but I think I still prefer the 360s. Also, am I the only one that thinks the replacements for Star and Select make no sense? What the hell is two boxes and three lines? That finally brings us to the Nintendo Switch's supply of controllers, the Joy-Con, the controllers that come packed in with the console. The Switch is an interesting situation. It had to have controllers that have to be on the console itself to enable handheld play, but be detachable to make use of a variety of different play styles. God, these things are too small. Listen, I adore so much about the Joy-Con, but they're basically taking everything in modern controllers and cramming them into something you'd find in a dollhouse. I mean, these things have a lot going on in them, a full suite of buttons and sticks, new HD rumble, motion controls, NFC. They're perfectly usable, just not that great. I love the idea of how they were designed to be used as two separate controllers, but is this a way to live? The shoulder buttons for the individual Joy-Con are miserable, so much so that Nintendo supplies straps to slide on for better ones. Using them together is alright, however, they're still more akin to the Nintendo 3DS controls compared to most home console controllers. For me personally, I go for the Switch Pro controller. This thing is truly no-nonsense, it gets right to the point. It uses a button and stick layout that makes me swoon, the texture of it all feels great, nice big meaty buttons, a solid battery life, all the technology from the Joy-Con. This is what you call a controller. I always keep the Joy-Con attached to the Switch for when I want to play portably, and keep the Pro Controller on standby for home console use. And that is a basic history and review of most of the major video game controllers. We've gone through a lot, and while not all of it has been great, it's all led to where we are now. The inception of motion controls, the pause button, the introduction of analog control with the 1292 advanced programmable video system. Jesus. Experience with number pads, trackballs, screens, these successes and failures helped us form some of the greatest game controllers out there. Don't immediately bat away new features and gimmicks introduced in controllers because they may be huge steps in the right direction for the industry. They may not be talked about as much as the games or consoles themselves, but they are some of the most important aspects of the video game industry. Well, let me know what your favorite or least favorite game controllers are, and if you'd excuse me, I have another, for real this time, meeting about video game related issues. This time on video game box art. You gotta be f***ing kidding me. Hey y'all, Scott here. I'm on life support now. No reason, just felt like it. I've been told the machine I'm hooked up to is doing some pretty great stuff. It's efficient, it's useful, it's made by Mad Cats.
I should probably start proofreading my will. Did you know hands can hold garbage and f***ing garbage? Game controllers are fairly understated in the grand scheme of things. I mean, as long as you can reach all the buttons at once, that shouldn't be an issue, right? They are ridiculously important to the gaming experience, but that importance comes at a price. As the years have gone on, official game controllers have risen in cost significantly. We go from the GameCube controller retailing for $19.99 to my scheduled laugh at the Switch Pro controller's price point. Huh. The prices of game controllers can be absolutely ridiculous, sometimes costing nearly as much as a new game, sometimes costing as much as a new game, more than a new game. $70, man, I found a mattress for that much. Now, I will admit, stuff like the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller and DualShock 4 have a lot of random junk thrown into them, and at least kind of explains why the prices are so much higher than controllers in the past. But then the Xbox One controller is pretty much identical to the Xbox 360 controller in terms of features, and it's $65. Did all the money go into giving the thumbsticks tire tracks? Controller Controllers can be expensive, sure, you can probably make it buy with just the one that came bundled with your console, but what if you want to play a local multiplayer game, or what if your controller breaks for some reason? You're gonna need an extra controller, and the official ones, those can be pricey. But, you always have other options. They give these away with car stereos. Third party controllers. Controllers not made by the company who makes the console. You never know what you're gonna get with these things. Since they're made by a company that had nothing to do with the actual console, they don't have to abide by any rules, designs, or legal restrictions, nothing. Now why would you get a third party controller instead of a first party one? Well, I can think of a few reasons, but most of the time, it's all about the price point. These bad boys would sometimes retail for considerably less than official controllers. You can use that money for new games and your mortgage. However, let's not throw all third party controllers under the bus here, because I consider them to fall under two types, big deals or big gimmicks. Either the controller is cheaper and that's why you'd want it, or it features something the official controllers don't. Like the QuickShot controller for the NES. This isn't supposed to be a replacement controller, it's supposed to be an alternative. If you want to use a joystick with your games, whip out the coffee table, jam the stick with the suction cups, this thing ain't going anywhere. This works well for arcade style games, or stuff like Top Gun if you're one of those people. But in terms of a controller with no real advantages compared to the official controllers outside of price point, the Hanyu Explorer 1 for the NES, literally just another company's version of the NES Advantage. There isn't much reason for you to pick this up other than the fact that it's cheaper than the official official advantage controller. However, this thing has some interesting features. These top two buttons do absolutely nothing, and there's a useless battery compartment. I really have to start using this term better. In the grand scheme of third-party controllers, these ain't too bad. Third-party controllers were more so gimmicky back in the NES days, mainly because you needed like two standard NES controllers at the very most, so for people to want other controllers, they needed to stand out. They needed to have features the regular controllers didn't have. That called for pretty much any unofficial controller to have turbo buttons, like the Turbo Touch 360 for the Sega Genesis. This gives me chills. We have switches to give any of the buttons turbo fire, but the star of the show here is the lack of a D-pad. I'm sure tons of people who saw this in the store went, YES! You ever just use the Genesis controller and... Ah, there's too much D-pad here. Now this, I mean no D-pad, is exactly what I wanted out of a Sega Genesis controller. This is a touchpad and it senses where your thumb is where your thumb is. Yeah, this doesn't work very well. You don't get the precision of an actual D-pad at all. I don't know if this is whacking out because of old age, but I couldn't imagine this ever working that well when it was new. But hey, if you want a more standard experience, here's the Sega Genesis Owl Pad. I'm sure somebody stood by this controller like you're waiting in the living room for your date to come downstairs and you're talking to her dad about how much you like the Sega Genesis controller. We're an Alpad family. What is up with the C button? I don't know how easy it is to see, but it is significantly stiffer than all the other buttons. The back is a soap dish. Now, if you're looking to buy retro gaming garb these days, you're likely to come across these off-brand controllers. They look pretty similar to the originals, but with a few things altered so Nintendo doesn't have a f***ing aneurysm. If there's just a blank space where the Nintendo logo should be, f***ing run. These things prey on people looking to buy old systems who need an extra controller. They're usually for sale at retro game shops and look almost identical to the the original controllers, but are almost always inferior in every way. Like, come on, $15? That's around the same price for an official N64 controller, but people keep buying these because they look so similar and they're brand new. At least back in the day, third-party companies respected the consumer. To differentiate themselves from the first-party companies, they made sure to add their own stupid f***ing twist to their product. Introducing the Boomerang 64. The analog stick fell off of mine and all that's left is a stick, so I had to improvise. Now, this isn't nearly as bad as it may seem. It is a chunk fest in my hands, but it gives you an N64 controller with a slightly more conventional layout. It has built-in rumble if you slide some AAAs in, and there are two whole Z buttons for maximum... 
But the D-pad is stiff, the L and R buttons are in totally out there locations, and overall it's just an awkward controller. Also, the name is a lie. The SuperPad 64, now this screams, oh fuck, oh fuck, I need a Nintendo 64 controller and only have $10. I'm gonna be saying that on my wedding night. It's a substitute, but that's all it really is. It doesn't excel at anything in comparison to the original. I mean, yeah, this isn't great, but I'm used to how not great it is. The SuperPad 64 just feels weird without those grips on the sides. It feels incomplete. Z feels like a gas station fuel button. The controller works, but that's all it really does. It's totally just for people who needed that one extra controller for multiplayer. The SuperPad 64 is the type of thing I think of first when I hear the term third-party controller. Cheaper in every sense of the word. But this was made by Performance. The company I immediately think of when I hear the term third-party controller is Mad Cats. If you walk into a building constructed by Mad Cats, get the f out of there. Get all the kids out of the room. Three, two, one. Jesus Christ, censor that. The only Mad Cats product I own legitimately without thinking twice about it being made by Mad Cats was my GameCube memory card, and I'm still happy to have it on me. Look at all these memories. An entire page of Nickelodeon game save files. I love gaming, but look at this. 16x, whatever the hell that means, keep it coming. I had so much storage space on this card. Mad Cats was never the worst supplier of controllers, but they were definitely known for their mediocrity. But I mean, come on, has a company who made a Dallas Cowboys PS2 controller ever steer you wrong? A lot of their controllers aren't terrible, but they're on their way up there. The Mad Cat's GameCube controller, talk about undercompensation. You take a regular GameCube controller and then just warp every element of the controller until it's a shrunken, grotesque GameCube pad. Oh, and bold up the fonts on the buttons. Just by looking at this thing, there is something undeniably cheap about it. Like many of these controllers, it works, but so does filing for bankruptcy, so whatever. Different people like different things. Well, what about the Mad Cat's arcade stick for the Xbox 360? With all the arcade titles available on the 360, you needed a good arcade stick to play them with. I still need a good arcade stick to play them with. This controller is all show, no go. You look at it and go, wow, this is everything a regular Xbox 360 controller is, but with controllers tailored for arcade games. A joystick with a fire button on top, a spinner for games like Arkanoid, this is gonna end in heartbreak. This is just a regular thumbstick on stilts. It has such a wide range of movement. Most arcade joysticks are locked in a set number of directions. Here you have full 360 degree movement, which let me tell you now, this does not work well for Ms. Pac-Man. The entire controller itself is too tiny, like you want to be able to slam an arcade controller on a coffee table and not have to worry about it moving all over the place. No, this one's too small and light to set down and play with, but it's too big and cumbersome to hold in your hands. This has a lot of the same problems as the Atari 2600 joystick in terms of size. I can't say Mad Cats didn't try with this controller, but they didn't. But want to know who did try with their controller? Nickelodeon. Put SpongeBob in your hands. SpongeBob controllers for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube. I remember advertisements for these, and yep, it is SpongeBob in your hands. It's a good Wednesday night controller. I'm not gonna use it all the time, but one day a week I'm good with. You get a lot of these novelty controllers made by third parties, like a Dallas Cowboys controller, damn it. Now, you can't go talking novelty controllers without bringing up Afterglow. Yeah, I was 16 at some point. This interests me. An Afterglow Wii remote, transparent in all the right ways. Lock some batteries in, sync it up, and that is fairly disappointing. They move some button placements around, like, the 1 and 2 buttons are at an angle, that's sort of annoying. Plus and minus are right next to the A button, honestly, a pretty okay change. But then the home button was moved all the way to the top, and you need a damn toothpick to hit it. Well, why sit here and whine, when we can whine with even more style? A rock candy nunchuck, finally a controller that answers my lucid dreams. The nunchuck finally has an ass. It's transparent plastic as well, but because of that, we get to see some of the iffy looking wire in here. That doesn't look too good. If this doesn't scream playing Goosebumps Horrorland, I don't know what does. Now, what if you're playing Xbox 360 and your hands start to bleed. Well, damn, you don't want to stop playing to dry the blood off, so introducing Airflow, the controller with a fan. You hit this button and the fan turns on. Well, that checks out. This is a very standard wired Xbox 360 controller, but with LEDs and a fan with two different speeds. Honestly, it's good at what it does. If you're really hankering for a controller with a fan, you can do a whole lot worse than Airflow. Speaking of good third-party controllers, the Logitech Wireless PS2 controller. Oh my god, this thing is really comfortable. Dare I say, more comfortable and sturdier than the official controller. The traditional PlayStation 1, 2, and 3 controllers just aren't really my thing, but this pucks it up a bit and just melts in my hands. Also, I like the blue underneath the analog sticks. Those are fun. Here we have a few controllers for the Nintendo Switch. First up is the 8-Bit Do SN30 Pro. I've always heard a lot about 8-Bit Do, Do, damn, whatever. They specialize in retro-esque Bluetooth controllers. This one obviously takes taking heavy inspiration from the SNES. And yeah, it's pretty good at what it sets out to do. I don't see this as a full-on Switch Pro Controller replacement, but as a supplemental controller for 2D platformers or retro stuff, then oh yeah, it's good. It also works on PC, Android, and 
irrelevant, so there are a ton of uses for this thing. But what about a controller made specifically for the Nintendo Switch? Well, just your luck, here's the Power A Wireless Controller. Themed after The Legend of Zelda, specifically with some Twilight Princess art, it's okay, I mean, it's perfectly fine. It has motion controls, you also get these buttons on the back you can map any of the other buttons to. However, you don't get HD Rumble or NFC here. For that, you need to chalk up an extra 20 bucks for the official Pro Controller, that's not worth it. The extra money may not be worth what the Pro Controller adds in terms of features, but I will say the extra 20 bucks is worth the more premium feeling of the Pro Controller. This is perfectly fine, it does the job, but at 50 bucks for a third-party controller, I'd just bring for a Pro Controller at that point. Here I have a bunch of PS3 controllers. All right, first up, this is the GameStop branded one. That feels all right, let me test out the trigger. Oh my God. The tier one wired PS3 controller, pretty much just like an Xbox One controller. The X got rubbed off here. <laughs> that means somebody must have used this thing. Rock Andy strikes again, this time with this tiny PS3 controller. This feels like something I get out of a capsule machine. Let me rewind a bit to the PS2, the TTX Tech Wireless Controller. I see they had to make sure the button symbols were different enough to avoid copyright problems with Sony. What are you talking about? That's not a PlayStation X, that's a Norse symbol. It's feeling like one of those be bon cool kind of days, you know? Here's the be bon cool for the Nintendo Switch. This hurts. Everything just doesn't feel right. These triggers, the sticks, the D-pad. No. Okay, I've never bought into third-party controllers before because you are almost never going to get the same experience or quality than from the first-party offerings. Sure, some stand out, but 90% of the time you're asking for trouble buying these things. Oh wow, a Nyko controller. Might as well be saying, oh wow, I can't just buy a pre-owned first-party controller or save up just a little more for the official one. Sure, some of them have their place in the market, but time and time again I just ask myself, why do most of these exist? And on top of that, Mad Cat's pulled a fast one on me. This isn't a life support machine. This was just a bread box! Hey all Scott here. I bought new clothes. That's why they always call me New Clothes Scott. I love designs like this so much. I should go as far as possible with that love. What kind of tattoo do you want, Clad? Could have just gotten the Xbox controller. It's a brand new day. I wake up and what do I do? I buy more useless trash. If I run out of money, I'll just sell another kidney. I don't care. Look, I bought another rice cooker for the collection. That's a core problem when it comes to your everyday video game player. We end up buying a lot of stuff we don't really need? I mean, sure, I don't need Rhythm Heaven Fever, damn it, I need two! They're obviously products we all want, but don't really need. However, buying new video games brings us entertaining experiences we wouldn't have had otherwise. But we all have those things we really don't need, but sorta of kinda want anyways, and game companies know this. That's why they all say, grab the paints, got some moron. I'm not as ashamed as I want it to be. These special editions, products that have a special little paint job that makes you squirm at the thought of not owning it. Even if you have the standard edition of a game console already and it works perfectly fine, you even think it already looks nice and sleek and all that, just when a glacier white PlayStation 4 gets announced, yeah, all right, where do I sign? Special edition game systems have somewhat puzzled me because in many cases, these special editions appeal to hardcore fans, fans who already own the console, so to have them buy a completely new one just for a different paint job, it's a lot to go through. Which is why I think special edition controllers are where it's at. The controllers are the kind of things you usually buy multiples of for your system, so hey, why not pick up the special ones? You can never have enough of this. But here's the thing, controllers are absolutely abused. These things are put through so much, and if you play games, you know you're prone to some thumb grease. To buy a controller based on its looks alone and with it only being available for a limited time, I almost don't want to use it. I know if I do, it's more susceptible to wear and tear, and if it breaks down, I don't want to buy another one. By the time I have to do that, it's going to be ten times more expensive online. Have you seen the Cheeto market? People pay top dollar for special trash. Imagine how much I have to pay for a new Halo Reach controller. Who chews on thumbsticks? Special edition controllers. They're always a joy to see. Plus, you can usually warn picking these up because you can never have too many controllers. However, I never want anything to ever happen to these. They're too precious. That's why I don't have anybody over anymore. Yeah, so I kind of have this weird thing where I have to lick every controller that I see. <gasps> Donkey Kong! Listen, I'll usually buy something like this when it's either A, related to a game I like, or B, the design makes me swoon. I own a Xenoblade Chronicles 2 controller and have no interest in the game. I feel like I'm on a list somewhere. But sometimes special edition controllers are more trouble than they're worth. Again, that's why nobody's invited over here anymore. You have the one guy that notoriously doesn't bathe his fingers go, yeah, I'll take the gold one. Like, what the f***? Don't do that to my controller! But to truly appreciate special edition controllers now, we have to go back to when companies said, do it yourself. 
People have been customizing their controllers ever since the dawn of time, and if you want to reach a bit, we could consider decals to be the first instance of the special edition. I think a lot of people have seen these Nintendo Power decals for NES controllers. You'd get them with the magazine and just stick them onto your gamepad. These things have always been a thing, still prevalent nowadays. These are the cheapest possible solution to give your controller some flair. The only one I technically have is the controller skin that came with the Sonic Forces bonus edition. Choking hazard? <laughs> Thank God I read that. But nobody likes talking sticky paper. Everybody wants to talk about controllers that come with paper pre-sticked. Special edition controllers really hit it big during the Nintendo 64 days. And not only were there multiple colors to choose from, but some fancy designs that were definitely harder to come by. Some of these were given away via promotions or sweepstakes or specific catalogs within magazines like the Millennium 2000 controller or the Nintendo Power 100th issue gold one. However, one I own happens to be the Donkey Kong 64 controller. It was a special order item through Nintendo Power. And not all too different compared to the standard yellow, but it's hauling the tips with this one. They're bananas. This design makes me way more okay with the standard controller layout. So that's what these things were supposed to be. Many look towards the golden controllers for their daily dose of dopamine. Nothing screams special edition more than crippling debt. So of course there was a gold Nintendo 64 controller, but there was an even golder asterisk controller that is way past rare. These ones were given away at a Star Fox 64 tournament at Nintendo's E3 1997 booth and are pretty similar to the standard gold you could get in stores. However, this one had a fancy Nintendo 64 logo on the front. I'd consider the Nintendo 64 to be where special controller variants were truly born. Sure, there were constant revisions of the Sega Genesis controller, for example, but those primarily boiled down to red buttons, black buttons. With the N64 offering four controller ports, that obviously meant more controllers were to be sold, so why not sweeten the deal a bit with some designs only a mother could love? These weren't revisions, rather they were for fans of the console and games. But at this time in gaming, special edition consoles were way more prevalent than just controllers. You were lucky if the controller included in the box got any love at all. The PS1 and Sega Saturn dabbled in this here and there, but we really had to take one giant leap of faith into the following generation where we can truly start to see some more special controllers make their debut. The Sega Dreamcast took some notes from the Nintendo 64. See, we have four controller ports, you know what that means. It's f***ing blue! But the GameCube was where it's at for special variants. I'd say it definitely wasn't on par with the N64, but we have some interesting ones here. What I happen to have is a controller you can only purchase via Club Nintendo Japan, the Luigi controller. Oh god, I can't wait to see what it's like. Who could have thought? Club Nintendo was home to some of the more sought after special editions for the console. We have a Mario, Wario, and standard Club Nintendo design, with the Mario design also being offered by Club Nintendo Europe. I honestly think the most interesting thing about these are the boxes. Not only do I like the official name being Luigi Controller, but they made sure to include denim. I know what you're thinking. I love the GameCube. There were a ton of other designs bundled with limited edition consoles, but what about controllers with special functions? Like see, I enjoy this, but I just want more. I think I found another choking hazard. The keyboard controller is the white whale of my video game collecting career. I want it, but right around the time I discovered it, it was pricey, no doubt, but definitely obtainable. Now we've officially entered the year 2020, and damn it, there goes my fifth kidney. This was only available in Japan and only for Fantasy Star Online, so you could communicate with other players quickly. Yes, this may have no use to me, but... But come on, who wouldn't want this? Scribes? Maybe Scribes. Of course, if we're talking limited special controllers during this era, there was, of course, the Resident Evil 4 controller. Oh, that's nice. What the f***? This is no doubt one of the most notoriously bizarre controllers ever created, a chainsaw. Now, of course, one of the iconic enemies in RE4 was the Chainsaw Man. Considering that he uses a chainsaw and you don't, I don't see how immersive this controller really is, but bonus points where bonus points are due, it truly feels like I'm playing a game with a chainsaw. This was also released for the PlayStation 2 and is definitely more of a product of Capcom's than Nintendo's or Sony's. Which that does bring up how third-party companies can definitely put out their own wacky additions, usually in cooperation with companies that specialize in this kind of trash. The Shadow the Hedgehog PS2 controller, yeah, lines out the store for that one. Sony was never the biggest into custom designs, and normally they'll just do new colors, and maybe some special ones here and there, but this is one area where the Redmonders reign supreme. Of all these options! Did you really think the publisher of Fusion Frenzy would put out the most controller variants? Now the original Xbox, they were pretty humble. Here and there we got a few, especially with special edition systems, no biggie. But then, the Xbox 360 came around. Is this a fucking joke? A lot of these are relatively inexpensive, considering I feel that collectors of Xbox stuff are way more endangered comparative to Nintendo and PlayStation collectors. Darwinism is hilarious. But that never stopped Microsoft from putting out just a ton of special edition controllers, many of which were just that. Controllers, you could buy them separately from a console bundle or something. Here I have a Halo Reach controller and a Gears of War 3 controller. I do like the overall look of both of them. I think the Gears one has a better overall design, but I love the minimalistic take on Reach's variant. But I bought these for like 10 bucks a pop online. I got this one back in the 360s heyday with my own 14 year old money. 
I like this one. It's been my go-to 360 controller ever since, and the material used feels really premium, and the overall design being completely grayscale is sleek as all hell. The only problem is some games may tell you hit the yellow button, and now you know my colorblind hell. Weirdly enough, Sony and Nintendo barely dived into the special controller market this generation. The Wii was basically just white for most of its life, and then by the time people stopped caring, that's when they added new colors, but none of these were particularly limited or special. I think the core special Wii Remote most jumped to is the Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword Edition. Gold with Zelda Insignia, it's a fine looking controller no doubt, but as one of the only special Wii Remotes? Eh. But speaking of gold controllers, only available via special editions of GoldenEye 007 was a Golden Classic Controller Pro. I love this thing. It's just gold, and I found it used at a GameStop back in the day. Again, I will reiterate, I love this thing. Now Sony, they had more specific game-based designs than Nintendo, but at least the Wii Remote was a completely new design. You didn't necessarily have to spice it up with fun colors and shapes. The PlayStation 3 controller was derivative of this, which was derivative of this. I can keep going. It just didn't do a ton with this thing outside of mostly colors, but that changed with the PlayStation 4. Look at all these. They really upped their game. We have Uncharted 4, the 20th anniversary of PlayStation, Piss. There are so many options now. Well, it looks like Microsoft finally has some competition on their hands. This is fun hell. They even fixed my biggest problem with that silver controller and have the colors displayed here. It's perfect. They even let you create your own custom controller colors online now. They are fucking loony. But hey, this one's greaseproof, a controller that addresses the biggest gaming hurdle. See, I want to play Halo, but I just love No Fork Spaghetti. Now, what did Nintendo do with the Wii U, the console with the most integral controller experience? Nothing. I mean, there was this Wind Waker one, which was only included in the console bundle. They never sold Wii U gamepad separately. But not even the Wii U Pro controllers got any special releases. All we got was white and black colors, but special Wii remotes and Wii U branded boxes were released, all featuring designs based on the Mario cast. And yep, I have twins. I do feel like these character-specific Wii remotes are a bit more cool than the GameCube ones. Certain colors are used on certain parts to represent the character, like the bottom one and two buttons are brown for his shoes, the plus and minus buttons are yellow for his overall buttons, and the back is color to his overalls in general. Other controller companies had similar ideas when making their own officially licensed Nintendo controllers. I have this Metal Mario Classic controller by PDP. These were primarily made for Smash Brothers for Wii U. It may not be a great controller, but it's not a good controller either. Design though is really cool, just with how shiny and metallic it looks. It almost but doesn't make up for the lackluster feeling buttons. Hori made their own licensed GameCube-like controllers for Wii remotes during Smash Wii U's Shine Time, which are far better, albeit not as good as the real deal. Which was alright, because Nintendo themselves reissued GameCube controllers for Smash Wii U's release, now with a Smash Ball on front. These are GameCube controllers all right, and Nintendo re-released them AGAIN for Smash Ultimate. I don't want to hear anybody argue this design is better than the old one. And that brings us to the Nintendo Switch, where special edition controllers are way more prevalent. Special colored Joy-Cons and Pro Controllers are finally getting some love. As previously stated, I have the Xenoblade Edition, I am terrible. But I also have the Smash Brothers one, which looks great. You have the Silver Smash Ball and White Grips. And I can already see paint chipping off. Do you see my problem with special edition controllers? See, I really do like these controllers. They look great, they look cool, but controllers are meant to be used, and I can't use these controllers without ever feeling guilty. They're too rare and valuable. On the other hand, special edition consoles look cool, but they also make much less sense to buy if you already have the console, though the design will hold up for much longer. So, I've come to the conclusion that I won't buy anything ever. I'm not doing it!